guys and welcome. Today I wanted to tell you about how we can settle other planets and in particularly the aspect of spreading life to other planets. First of all, I will outline several planets that can potentially be settled and have the most favorable conditions for human settlements. After that, I will tell you what kind of progress we have made so far in both growing plants on International Space Station and on other planets as well. After that, I will tell you what kind of scientific developments and technologies can be used to recreate greenhouses on other planets and start changing them little by little. After that, I will wrap it up with uh, parter forming, which is a concept of creating a large dome greenhouse, which will uh, cover an entire small, at least, region of the planet and will start reshaping it to resemble something akin to Earth with our flora and fauna at least as close as it can get to there. By the end, I will tell you some ideas and some concepts on terraforming. It might seem far-fetched right now, but at least we can theorize about it. The first planet, Mars, has nearly equal day lengths as we have here on Earth. However, it takes 687 days for Mars to revolve around the Sun compared to our terrestrial 365 days. The axis has 25 degrees tilt, which is near 23.5 tilt of that of our Earth. However, its orbit is more elliptical, making seasons last twice as long. The most noticeable difference is that the atmosphere is extremely thin. It is also 95% carbon dioxide, with average atmospheric pressure on Mars being 7.5 millibars, compared to 1013 millibars on Earth. On top of that, there is harmful radiation that bombards the planet, Due to those factors, Martian weather is vastly different from Mars. It is an extremely cold planet with an average temperature around minus 8 degrees. Temperatures can dip to minus 225 degrees around the poles. Periods of warmth are very brief, with highs that can reach 70 degrees for a brief time around noon at the equator in the summer. Rain is non-existent on Mars, and water exists in the polar caps and quite likely in the underground reservoirs. The polar ice deposits is something that is widely known, however, the underground reservoirs also exist on Mars with all likelihood. The recurring slope linear or RSL uh, streaks would serve as an evidence for that. Previously, scientists have estimated that they are caused by transient flows of briny water at or just beneath the Martian surface. The aquifers feeding the RLS lie about 2,460 feet or 750 meters underground, according to the new study. Abotalib and Hagi found a spatial correlation between RSL and tectonic and impact-related faults, features that could facilitate the movement of water from deep underground to the surface. This is very similar to the water movements that we can see here on Earth. On July last year, satellites have also found a large underground lake under the Mars South Pole, about 12 miles across, hidden under a mile of ice. Scientists have offered some evidence for such reservoirs, as well as strong amounts of water on the planet. Hopefully, we will find out more about the water reservoirs on Mars as we explore the planet. There are also giant dust storms on Mars that are a considerable hazard. At times, those can last for months, blanketing the entire planet, turning the sky haze red. Giant dust devils often kick up the oxidized iron dust that covers Mars' surface. It is also a permanent part of the atmosphere, with higher amounts of it in northern fall and winter and lower amounts in northern spring and summer. The dust storms are the largest in the solar system. To briefly outline the most important environmental factors on the Moon, uh, first of all, there is a problem with radiation. It is threefold. This includes solar rays, solar winds, and cosmic rays. All of those combines can contribute to a large amount of radiation, 30 rem per year. That is well above what an average radiation worker receives, which is 5 rem per year. While the general public norm is as low as 0.5 rem per year. This coupled with the solar flares that can deliver up to 1000 rem. Those flares thankfully happen only a few days per 11 year cycle. However, the cosmic rays are constant. Therefore, the astronauts are exposed to a constant influx of radiation on the lunar surface, making it a permanent factor that has to be dealt with. Another major hazard would be meteoroids that can bombard the lunar surface from time to time. However, it is somewhat easier to deal with, particularly if we consider shelters and vehicles. There are also considerable temperature fluctuations from 100 degrees Celsius to minus 173 degrees Celsius. The moon also tilts on about 1.55 degrees, which is far less than our Earth's axis. Most of the lunar surface is made up of the heavily cratered terrain. 
rich in mineral plagioclase field spar, also known as lunar highlands. The uncompacted pockets of regolith go as deep as 10 to 20 feet and can be easily dug up in the same place to create lunar shelters in the smallest amount of time. Currently, there has been a successful attempt to grow the cotton seeds on China, Changi for Moonlander. The mission became the first touchdown on the surface of the far side of the moon on January 2019, designed to study the lunar surface and geology of the von Karman crater. Together with the scientific instruments, the lander carried a sealed container with a biosphere experiment. This experiment contained soil and cotton, rapeseed, arabidopsis, and potato seeds. This was the first time that biological matter was grown on the moon. Going inside a 7-inch tall canister on the lander that supplies the organism with enough air, water, and nutrients, and controlled temperature and humidity, allowing them to grow safely and continuously. It should be possible to obtain all of the necessary nutrients required for the plant life from the lunar soil. Hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen will be extractable by heating it. Once the necessary conditions are created, the plant should be able to adapt and grow in the lunar ground. There are two more options for protectional colonization. However, those are farther away and are not in direct plans of the current space programs. Those are Venus and Titan. First of all, the Venusian year is around 225 Earth days long. This might seem short, though the time from one sunrise to the next is only about only uh, 117 Earth days long. Uh, the atmosphere is 96.5% carbon dioxide with 3.5 nitrogen. Minor amounts of sulfur dioxide, argon, water carbon monoxide, helium, and neon. Uh, the magnetic field is only 0.000015 times that of Earth's field. Venus crust is mostly basalt and is estimated to be 6 to 12 miles, which is around 10 to 20 kilometers. The Venus sky gets covered by clouds every four Earth days, driven by hurricane force winds going as fast as 224 miles per hour or 360 kilometers per hour. The super rotation of the planet's atmosphere is 60 times faster than the rotation of Venus itself, and is one of the Venus' biggest mysteries. The winds at the planet's surface are much slower, estimating just a few miles per hour. The Venus Express spacecraft has all found evidence of lightning on the planet. It is unique since it's not associated with clouds of sulfuric acid. Scientists are excited by the electrical discharges because they can break molecules into fragments that can then combine with other fragments in unexpected ways. A long-lived cyclone on Venus that was first observed in 2006 is in a constant flux, with elements constantly breaking apart and reforming. The clouds also carry signs of meteorological events known as gravity waves, created when, mine, when winds blow uh, over geological features, causing rises and falls in the layers of air. Unusual stripes in the upper clouds of Venus are dubbed blue absorbers or ultraviolet absorbers because they strongly absorb light in the blue and ultraviolet wavelengths. Those are soaking up huge amounts of energy, nearly half of the total solar energy the planet absorbs. As such, they seem to play a major role in keeping Venus as hellish as it is. Their exact composition remains uncertain. Some scientists suggest it could even be life, Although many things would need to be ruled out before accepting such a conclusion. Titan is another interesting prospect for a future settlement and further colonization. It is Saturn's largest moon, an icy world whose surface is completely obscured by a golden haze atmosphere. Titan is the second largest moon in our solar system. Only Jupiter's moon, Ganymede, is larger, by a mere 2%. Titan is even larger than Mercury. It's unique since it's the only moon in the solar system with a dense atmosphere, and it is the only world besides Earth that has standing bodies of liquid, including rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. Its atmosphere is primarily nitrogen, plus a small amount of methane. Uh, thus, it is the only other place in the solar system known to have an Earth-like cycle, with liquids raining from the sky flowing across the surface, filling lakes and seas. It is also likely to have a subsurface ocean of water. Because of its distance from the sun, the sunlight is 100 times fainter than here on Earth. Titan takes 15 days and 22 hours to complete a full orbit of Saturn, while Saturn takes 29 Earth's years to orbit the sun and Saturn's axis of rotation is tilted like Earth, resulting in several seasons. However, those seasons last more than 7 Earth's years. The surface of Titan is the most Earth-like from the entire solar system that we can find. However, its temperature is so low, minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 179 degrees Celsius, that 
ice plays a role of a solid rock. It may have volcanic activity as well, with liquid water, lava, instead of molten rock. Its surface sculpted by flowing methane and ethane, which carves river channels and fills great lakes with liquid natural gas, with no other places except of Earth having that kind of activity. Titan has a thick atmosphere, which is about 60% greater than on Earth. It extends 10 times higher than Earth's for nearly 370 miles, or 600 kilometers into space, due to its lesser gravity. It composes from 95% nitrogen and 5% methane. First of all, we could say that the initial steps of terraforming both Mars and Moon were done by successfully growing the plants on the International Space Station, as well as seeds that were sent to the lunar surface on the Chinese mission. This might not seem much, but it proves the possibility of it. Currently, NASA scientists at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida are collaborating with the university to help create sustainable resource for deep space missions. Their prototypes include inflatable deployable greenhouse to support plant and crop production. The water fruit will be taken from the regular surface and then oxygenated and given nutrient salts that will continuously flow across the root zone of the plants and return to the storage system. The next step of it would be to use additional lunar greenhouse units for specialized testing to ensure the system will adequately support a crew of astronauts working on either lunar or Martian surface. With computer models to simulate the automatic controls of the environment and provide a constant level of oxygen, the developed prototypes are cylindrical, 18 feet long and more than 8 feet in diameter, created by NASA's partners, Sadler Machine Company. Similarly to all the surface station units uh, for astronauts, the greenhouse units would likely be buried under the surface of regolith, thus requiring specialized lead lightning. There is also an option for hybrid natural and artificial lightning. The solar light. Uh, can be captured with light concentrators that track the sun and then convey the light to the chamber using fiber optic bundles. One of the most interesting greenhouse projects right now is Eden ISS, Space Greenhouse. Future long-term crewed space missions will require locally grown food. Eden ISS has proven the feasibility of a space greenhouse in the Antarctic and thus demonstrated that this technology could also be used to produce food on the Moon and Mars, says Hans-Jörg Ditus. DLR executive board member for space research and technology. The company has previously created numerous greenhouse projects in Antarctic. The information that they have gathered is an outstanding example of how we can also conduct research into other forward-looking issues. The ability to explore regions that are hostile to human life brings us closer to human spaceflight and colonizing other planets. Not to mention that having a fresh supply of fruit and vegetables is essential for a healthy stay on a lunar or Martian surface. They have also successfully applied remote control technology. The last test run was a complete success. Now the current AWI overwintering crew is continuing the operation of the greenhouse with strong support from the control center in Bremen, where everything was remotely monitored. The procedures developed last year are currently proving their worth in minimizing the crew's workload and keeping the processes as simple as possible. Similar modules can also be incorporated into larger Martian and lunar module, modular bases. Particularly if we are talking about a set of livable modules with living rooms, laboratories, sleeping rooms that were mentioned in my previous video on the moon settlements. And by developing those bases further, we can actually start approaching terraforming by further expanding lunar bases and as well as Martian bases until there is a scale of full-fledged settlements. Some technologies and ideas can help us with it. An interesting recent development was done by Harvard University, who have devised a way to terraform Mars by placing sheets of silica aerogel on the planet's surface to warm it up. The silica aerogel greenhouse shields were devised by Robin Wordsworth, Ronald L. Kerber and Charles Cockell. Those shields are intended to replicate the greenhouse effect. They would be made from silica aerogel, a transparent material with low thermal conductivity, and by spreading them across the surface, it would be possible to recreate the greenhouse effect by trapping heat that would warm the ground below. A thin layer of this gel, 97% of which is air, is enough to raise the temperature of the Martian surface to above the melting point of water. Additionally, blocking the hazardous ultraviolet radiation and allowing enough visible light for photosynthesis to occur. The practicality of such shields lies in their ability to be applied to specific areas and then easily be scaled up. They can range from a few square meters to 
entire planetary regions. The scientists have already conducted a number of experiments in Mars-like environments to test the warming potential of the sheets. They found that the layers of silica aerogel, measuring 2 to 3 centimeters thick, were enough to warm the surface to the main melting point of liquid water or even higher. Other tests explored the effects of the sheet covering over time found that they could warm up several meters below surface level to allow for liquid water for years after years. Also, the research has estimated that there is a number of nutrients readily available on Mars, with even greater amounts of iron and sulfur than those found on Earth. The main challenge would be finding the ways to manufacture the products on the site. Another very interesting idea for terraforming Mars and populating it with life involves introducing terrestrial bacteria to Mars. It derived from the fact that our own Earth had its first life in single-celled form that survived on the diet of sulfur. Most of our atmosphere at the time consisted of carbon dioxide, methane and other greenhouse gases, leaving the air toxic for us and most of the modern flora and fauna. Then about 2.5 billion years ago, something happened. With what amounts to a snap of the fingers in geologic time scale, the atmosphere was pumped full of oxygen in what we call the Great Oxygenation Event. The abundance of oxygen meant that new, more diverse kinds of life could take a hold on the young planet, such as eukaryotes. Fast forward a few billion years ago, and complicated, multicellular life like ourselves are walking around the planet. It is most likely that most of the oxygen came from cyanobacteria, tiny blue-green single-celled life that first had photosynthesis, with oxygen being a byproduct of their life cycle. Thus, the scientists hope to recreate the great oxygenation event with the help of those bacteria. As previously mentioned, Mars has an atmosphere that is 95% carbon dioxide, providing half of the necessary nutrition for cyanobacteria. The other ingredient, water, would be a bit harder to come by, but it still exists on Mars in the form of ice and hopefully beneath the Martian surface. We would start with areas where we know liquid water exists and dump many cyanobacteria there, together with some other microbes that produce greenhouse gases. NASA has already started with preliminary tests. The Mars Echo Poiesis testbed is a proposal for a device to be included with the future robotic missions to Mars. It assembles a drill with a hollow chamber inside. It will bury itself in the Martian soil, preferably somewhere with liquid water. Then it would release a container full of cyanobacteria into the chamber with sensors detecting whether microbial life would produce oxygen or other byproducts. It was already tested in a simulated Martian environment here on Earth, yielding positive results. There is a more advanced approach to terraforming that could potentially be next step and would still be resistant to both radiation and meteoroids, which are two probably most harmful factors that we face right now, though it should be established only after the initial base was developed to a maximum capacity and preferably after a fully fleshed underground base has been established, at least on Moon, as I mentioned in my previous video. Those would be about creating large-scale greenhouse dumps. They would serve a twofold purpose. First, providing a constant supply of food to the inhabitants, and second, being able to make first considerable advancements in planting the flora and recreating the near natural cycle of Earth. With enough oxygen, moisture, and right temperature of air to sustain sizable green land. Thus, we should see uh, how the plant and animal life would adapt to the Martian environment. This stage would most likely be a culmination of colonization efforts at least in a foreseeable future, with subsequent steps involving recreating the magnetosphere near what it is on Earth, as well as atmosphere similar to ours, coupled with enough water and oxygen to completely reshape the planet. This would require technologies that unfortunately we do not possess yet. The term that is used to describe the greenhouses on other planets is Pareto forming. The basic idea is about building a sustainable ecosystem capable of supporting a hospitable atmosphere and life cycle for long-term habitation. And even though terraforming may seem like a distant dream right now, converting a portion of another planet is far more reachable and feasible. Using this method, sections of a planet that are otherwise inhospitable or cannot be terraformed as a whole could be made suitable for human habitation. It would be especially useful on the planets or moons that uh, have little to no atmosphere, or a very thin atmosphere, and where much of the surface is subject to little levels of heat and radiations as well. So this method would be extremely resistant to any natural hazards. 
Hypothetically, such colonies would be able to have enough resources for thousands and even hundreds of thousands if developed to a large capacity inhabitants. With all likelihood, such process would involve 3D printing and in-situ resource utilization ISRU, use of the local resources to manufacture everything on the surface, at least at the early stages, including building materials, energy, breathable air, and portable water. The core idea of it is to create enclosed settlements that could be built on site without the need to import a lot of fabricated parts or building materials from Mars. Once that is done, they would be able to achieve a degree of self-sufficiency. The bases would need to have enough protection against radiation and extreme conditions, not to mention a close proximity to resources and energies. The bases would have to be built in locations that afford natural protection against meteoroids and dust storms in case of Mars, and are also preferably resource-rich. There is also a possibility of using a magnetic shielding. The concept was proposed by civil engineer Marco Peroni at the 2018 American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronauts, AIAA, Space and Astronautics Forum and Exposition. It included a modular base architecture with hexagonally shaped units being grouped together in a spherical configuration beneath an apparatus that resembled a torus, which would be made of high voltage electric cables generating electromagnetic field to protect against radiation. It would be capable of generating a magnetic field of 8 microteslas, or 0.08 cos, compared to Earth's 25 to 65 microteslas, 0.25 to 0.65 cos. The apparatus was needed to be strengthened further in order to keep the inhabitants safe, but it would still be in the early stages of development. It's very similar to solenoid moon-based concept that was proposed by Peron earlier in 2017, which was about transparent domes enclosed by a toroid-shaped structure and high-voltage cables as well. The further construction would most likely rely upon regolith and aluminium insulation. This combination would be both cheap and effective for radiation and meteoroids protection. In addition, those would be scalable and it would be possible to expand such domes as the settlement develops. There are propositions for creating large transparent domes. However, it is extremely important to consider all of the environmental factors before starting large-scale production, along with availability of the local resources. Drawing from it, the larger idea was to enclose the entire planet in a humongous shield that would protect it from both meteoroids and radiation. However, in my opinion, it sounds extremely inefficient in terms of resources. Instead, it would be wiser to focus on recreating the magnetic field and natural atmosphere, possibly going as far as creating artificial atmospheres that could be contained. Uh, we would definitely need to achieve considerable progress in creating artificial magnetic fields, and it might seem a bit far-fetched right now, but we should consider that it will happen in 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, it will be by the time we have completely established a large-scale lunar and Mars bases. So we will definitely see some advancement in space colonization technologies by that time. And the current rotational methods are in no way sufficient to recreate uh, the magnetic field in the planetary scale. The current technology that comes near it involves magnets for recreating it in a small scale, but the artificial gravity is in its infancy right now, and with all likelihood uh, the progress that is definitely required uh, to bring us better understanding of how entire artificial magnetic fields can be recreated on other planets will be achieved in the coming years. The key here would be to protect the entire planet from radiation and create the atmosphere with enough oxygen to support uninhibited human existence. It is an extremely long-term effort that would be continued with generations to come, but once achieved, it would serve as a key instrument to spreading humanity to other planets in our solar system and even beyond which is a logical step in development of the entire humankind. We are also likely to see new materials and technologies developed that would prove to be more efficient as construction materials on other planets. Continuous progress in space exploration and colonization should bring us closer to terraforming. Even though we are very far from it right now, we can possibly start with adapting isolated portions of other planets and hopefully learn how we can transform them in their entirety. Thank you for watching the video, I really hope that you enjoyed it, if so, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. You can read my entire article on the subject by following a link below. 
Also, please check out our store. We have a lot of good consumer electronics at really low prices. Thank you and have a great day.